Good evening. Welcome back um, to the next topic. Uh, this will be on uh, pancreatitis in children. What is new? And this will be delivered by uh, Dr. Douglas Fishman. And uh, he uh, is known to the uh, world as um, uh, what is it, a leader in therapeutic endoscopy and as well as uh, his main area of interest is in uh, pancreatology. And currently is professor of pediatrics uh, at Baylor College of Medicine, Texas. And uh, where is the director of the uh, pancreati, uh, pancreatic biliary program and therapeutic endoscopy? And thank you very much, Dr. Douglas Fishman, for accepting an invitation. Over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I hope someday that I'll be able to join you for this meeting in person. Uh, my name is Doug Fishman. For those of you that I have not met, and my talk today is pancreatitis in children. What's new? My goals today are to review a little bit of the nomenclature for pancreatitis, discuss some of the recent highlights of both acute, recurrent, and chronic pancreatitis in children, and to discuss intermixed in this talk available imaging and procedure modalities. So what's new? Today I want to talk about the definitions, uh, a little bit about IV fluids, feeding, imaging, and then ERCP for pancreatic disease. Pancreatitis in children is diagnosed more frequently we also have improved testing, probably more recognition for this. The acute causes in children, most commonly infection or systemic illness, gallstone as we know in alcohol in adults. 10 to 15% of patients may have an additional or at least second episode. And at least in the United States, we're seeing increasing numbers of gallstones in children. Chronic pancreatitis, we now know to be both genetic and anatomic. Uh, and it's more commonly life-threatening in adults, but pediatric patients can have significant and life-altering pancreatitis. First, I want to talk a little bit about gallstone pancreatitis in pediatrics. And we know that there's a wide range uh, in pediatric patients with gallbladder disease. Our experience reported a few years ago was about 10%. In Toronto, they reported about 7% in symptomatic patients and about 1% in asymptomatic patients. Uh, there was a series from Montreal, an, uh, an ultrasound study that looked at 13 out of 48 patients with gallstones and out of 2,200 ultrasounds for abdominal pain. So uh, relatively high rates of pancreatitis, uh, all things considered. I do want to focus a little bit on the, the specific types of pancreatitis because I do think it kind of shapes how we think about pancreatitis and uh, the types of uh, management that we will uh, uh, entertain for each of these patients. So. Uh, these were reclassified a few years ago. Uh, we have interstitial edematous pancreatitis, or IEP, and that's acute inflammation of the parenchyma and peripancreatic tissue without tissue necrosis. Parenchyma is enhanced on CT. And then there's necrotizing pancreatitis, which is inflammation associated with pancreatic necrosis with or without pancreatic tissue involvement and lack of enhancement on CT. I show you this schematic from the New England Journal a few years ago, and I really do think it's important because you see the red circle there for hypoperfusion. If this is a vascular insufficiency event, whether it's inflammatory, uh, something like lupus or an ischemic event, you go to the right of the curve or the right of the chart, which is more necrosis. Um, if you have more just inflammatory change, be it from virus or something else, you're more likely to go down, get inflammation and then fluid, coll fluid collections and then later pseudocysts. So I do think that's important about how we think about these patients and kind of who's more likely to get sick. Now, we like to dichotomize things into either you're one or the other, but there's certainly a lot of overlap because I'm sure all of you have seen patients where they, it looks like, oh, maybe it's early necrosis. And then six weeks later, there's a pseudocyst and nothing else. So certainly there's uh, overlapping. Uh, when we think about severity, um, we can classify that as mild, moderate, or severe based on the adult guidelines, at least. Uh, mild is absence of organ failure. And with severe, you have persistent organ failure more than 48 hours. And again, there's a lot of subtleties. Several people have looked at various scoring systems in both pediatrics and adults. And again, it's very difficult when we use um, when we use the actual complication as part of your scoring system. Like for example, pseudocysts have been used in several of the pediatric scorings. Uh, it's very difficult to then classify to say you're really severe if you're already using that, as you can appreciate. Um, just a brief case presentation. Um, this 11 year old that had EBV positive T cell lymphoproliferative disease and secondary hemophagocytic syndrome, 
Um, and I show this just because it's, you know, we all, whenever I talk to an adult a GI doctor, they're like, you see pancreatitis? And I say, yeah, just like all of you, we see a lot of it. And uh, these patients get very sick. Um, so this is a patient who had a very complicated course, uh, admitted for fever and weakness, uh, was in the ICU for encephalitis, uh, increased nausea, abdominal pain, and ultimately went to the PICU uh, pediatric intensive care unit for abdominal distension, respiratory distress, and required hemodialysis. Had blood cultures that were positive for Burkholderia and had gram negative rod bacteremia. Um, it was early noted that he had some elevation of his lipase, okay, only 200, which is our cutoff is uh, 110. Um, but later on, uh, developed worsening uh, pancreatic fluid collections uh, with extension towards his spleen and some layering sludge. This was the first image, and you can see uh, that there's a large pancreatic fluid collection here. This is on CT scan. And uh, he really didn't have significant improvement. Uh, we planned conservative management based on how sick he was. Um, and it, just another example from his CT scan a few weeks later. Um, and ultimately, this is a patient that went for uh, drainage. And I'm, although clearly you have experts to discuss these types of things today, uh, I'm going to focus on just the pancreatitis. So certainly guidelines are really important. Again, we can't, we try to, when we write guidelines, we try to say what's going to be the best for the majority of patients. Um, and it certainly does, is not one size fit all, but um, the EPC and HPSG gave some recent evidence-based guidelines for the management. Um, and um, I think that's something to certainly consider. Um, the major things that are going on right now, and I think one of the hot topics is fluid management. Um, I think we certainly now appreciate that early fluid replacement is important. It corrects hypovolemia. It increases the perfusion of the pancreas. It improves the microcirculation and reduces necrosis, getting back to what I mentioned before with the hypoperfusion events that can occur. Um, and there's certainly data that shows that fluid resuscitation within the window of intervention, that usually means the 24 to 72 hours, uh, first 70, 24 to 72 hours, reduces both morbidity and mortality in adults. In children, uh, aggressive fluid, hydr fluid hydration improved outcomes with fewer ICU admissions due to SIRS and shortened hospital stays. This was shown by Abuel Haja at Cincinnati. So which IV fluid should be used in acute pancreatitis? Well, there are no controlled pediatric trials available on the type and volume of parental fluids used in resuscitation. There is a multi-center study of 40 cases in adult acute pancreatitis that showed a significant decrease in SIRS with Ringer's LR solution compared to normal saline. Aggressive IV hydration with LR appears to reduce the development of post-ERCP pancreatitis, but is not associated with, and is not associated with a, a volume overload. Other studies show no added benefit from LR compared to normal saline in terms of mortality length or hospital stay. I can tell you that we've gone to lactated ringers for both our ERCP patients, as well as our uh, admissions to the hospital for acute pancreatitis. Due to the lack of unequivocal guidelines, early aggressive fluid management at a rate of more than one and a half to two times the maintenance is recommended in children in the first 24 hours. LR at 20 milliliters per kilogram bolus, depending on dehydration status, and then we go to D5 LR at least one and a half to two times maintenance. The other major uh, consideration that we have in our pediatric patients is when to feed. Uh, this uh, somewhat landmark study from New England in 2014 uh, look, was it, uh, done in Dutch hospitals, 208 patients, randomized, multi-center, and there were no significant differences between the early group of feeding and the, and the later group. Uh, ma major infections were similar, 25, 26%, and the death rates were clinically similar, 11 to 7%. In the on-demand group, 72 patients, 69% tolerated diet and did not require a feeding tube or a tube feeding, and there was no difference in the rate of infection or death in high-risk patients. Um, this study is certainly a little bit complicated because it does, um, you know, most of our patients aren't ready to like eat on the moment they come in. So I think it's a little bit, uh, certainly take it with a grain of salt. Um, when it comes to feeding, the EPC guidelines uh, suggested oral feeding can be started as soon as tolerated, even in the presence of systemic inflammatory markers and before the amylase or lipase has decreased. At our hospital, we check, we're supposed to check it on admission and maybe not for a week or so. Uh, that doesn't always happen. Um, if adequate oral feeding is not tolerated or the required calories can't be achieved by oral feeding within three days, endoral tube feeding is recommended and it's not decided whether it's NG or NJ. Um, 
in, a, in acute pancreatitis, it can be either. Um, and both elemental and polymeric formulas are appropriate in the management of acute pancreatitis, although physiologically it doesn't always make that much sense. Um, complete parental feeding is used as a second line of treatment in acute pancreatitis, and certainly in someone who's not expected to eat for three to five days should certainly be considered. Um, again, this is from uh, another from Cincinnati. Early feeds are feasible in acute pancreatitis and pediatrics. Early feeds weren't associated with increased pain or longer hospital course. Um, and early feeds did not cause further evaluation of the serum lipase. Uh, you also pr probably know that there's a paper in pediatrics in 2020 uh, looking at feeding and again, not uh, major differences uh, as well. Uh, this study again from Cincinnati uh, looked at lipase on the y-axis and fat intake on the uh, x-axis and uh, the higher the fat intake, the lower the lipase, which is not that surprising. Um, and then again, looking at fat intake to pain, um, higher fat per kilogram was associated with lower daily pain severity, which again is not exactly what you might expect. Um, when we think about imaging of patients in pancreatitis, again, not a lot of data here, but I think really important principles to think about um, both from a safety standpoint and as well as cost. Uh, think about abdominal ultrasound. Again, we use that on almost all of our patients as a baseline study. Certainly CT scan gets used uniformly. And what I usually tell our families is that the reason you got a CT scan is you, you didn't necessarily go to a pediatric hospital where they have an ultrasound tech on call 24 seven because we look for things like pyloric stenosis. Um, and if, if you or I were going to go to the hospital, they're worried about something very serious and so that we get CT scans. Uh, MRI uh, is with and without secretin, certainly can be used to evaluate the pancreas, not usually in acute pancreatitis. Um, endoscopic ultrasound certainly, and as well as ERCP. And the goal is to, is to have a high test with diagnostic yield, something that's quick, low radiation and low cost. Benefits of ultrasound, obviously it's fast, no radiation, you can evaluate wall thickness, detect gallstones and detect fluid collections. Uh, and I also use kind of the little mini trick of, look, if I see fluid collection early, then I certainly may have it late. Now, you certainly can have patients that have no fluid collections early, have a ductal injury, and then later have it. But certainly if you don't have it early, you're less likely to have it late, uh, at least in pediatrics. Um, this example here, you can see the measuring the bile duct and you can just a little trick. Um, and it also, you cheat up in the left-hand corner, it tells you it's the long CBD uh, and the long axis. And again, this is measuring the uh, common bile duct and right below it is the portal vein. And the uh, bile duct should be a third to two thirds the diameter of the portal vein. So certainly here, it tells you that it's 0.74 um, millimeters, or sorry, 7.4 millimeters, and uh, and certainly that's way too big. So especially in this age patient, uh, the challenges are that the sensitivity for common bile zones is around 40 percent. Clinically significant sludge can be missed. The pancreas and bile duct are not always uh, well visualized due to air in the small bowel, and findings in acute pancreatitis are most often normal. Uh, when we think about CT scans, the, the good part about them, are, as I mentioned earlier, they're fast, they're relatively cheap. Uh, they can evaluate a patient in acute deterioration. They give you excellent views of the pancreas. Uh, on the con side, they re sometimes require anesthesia for young children, and there's radiation exposure. 200 times the, the dose of one chest x-ray or uh, a, a flight from, say, Boston to Rome. Um, it does require contrast in many cases, and it doesn't provide therapy. Um, is a paper I refer you to do is uh, injured children receive twice the radiation dose at non-pediatric trauma centers compared to those with, that are pediatric trauma centers. So just to keep that in mind, and many uh, adult or pediatric hospitals have special protocols if they're going to do a, a study on a pe pediatric patient. And adult protocols often have pancreatic protocols, which actually give even more radiation when you're specifically looking at the pancreas. So certainly there's been a change in pediatric CT utilization. Uh, the revised Atlanta classification recommends limiting CT scan use uh, for patients diagnosed with pancreatitis in the first 72 hours, unless the diagnosis is unclear or the patient is declining or deteriorating. And again, certainly having a limited use of CT scans of pancreatitis. Uh, I actually put it in our note that uh, we recommend ultrasound in our MRI, uh, unless again, clinical uh, change and uh, our need for CT scan. So again, it doesn't mean you can't have a CT scan, but at least it puts that uh, into people's heads at least. MRCP certainly can be used. This is a boy uh, who actually had a, uh, some bile duct stones and a congenital anomaly. Um, MRCP obviously has no radiation, excellent for biliary and pancreatic ana anatomy, contrast not required for all studies, differentiate between stones and tumors, 
and MRCP has comparable sensitivity and specificity to ERCP for bile duct stones. However, it is expensive, uh, limited availability, requires anesthesia for young children, even under eight sometimes, uh, or developmental delays. Uh, it doesn't image as well in, when patients have ascites, and it obviously doesn't provide a therapy. Uh, contrast that to endoscopic ultrasound, which is uh, obviously more and more used in pediatrics. It has no radiation, but can offer several therapies, uh, and it can be used in conjunction with the RCP. The con is that it uh, is ex very expensive, especially the initial setup. Uh, size of the patient can be limited, especially if you're doing something therapeutic. It absolutely requires anesthesia. Uh, it's a big scope and a little patient. Uh, there's no radiation, again, potential therapy. Uh, but and somewhat, depending on the center, limited pediatric experience or availability. Uh, finally, ERCP. Uh, this is a patient who has a, a anomalous long common biliary pancreatic union or long common channel. Uh, you can see there's a stone here uh, and the pancreatic duct coming off the bile duct here. This is a patient who actually came to us and had their gallbladder taken out early and not realizing that what the actual problem was. Uh, this is the endoscope here, and you can see the catheter and the wire going up into the liver. Uh, obviously, ERCP offers stone management. You can put stents. You can directly visualize with something like spyglass. There's a perceived benefit by both physicians and patients when we look at pancreatitis. Relatively low pancreatitis rates uh, varies anywhere between zero to 10%, uh, sometimes up to 20% in higher risk patients. It has the lowest radiation exposure relative to these other studies, depending on the user. Um, it re does require anesthesia, variable radiation, as I said, potential therapy. Equipment is not usually sized for pediatric patients, and that's certainly variable depending on center and actually locale. Uh, and there's availability of gastroenterologists trained to perform, but again, that also varies. In a recent study we published in gastrointestinal endoscopy, uh, we looked at uh, patients who had ERCP for uh, anticipated stone disease. Uh, we recognized that 74% of patients had common bile duct stones. And there was no difference using the total bilirubin. However, conjugated bilirubin was the only identifiable factor. And the conjugated bilirubin level of 0.5, again, with a cutoff of 0 to 0 0.3, was really important. However, the reason I bring this study up is that we identified that ERCP, when done for gallstone pancreatitis in 26 of 95 patients, basically half of the patients didn't have a stone when we went to ERCP, which was clinically significant. And that has certainly changed our the way that we manage these patients. So we do more EUS and more MRCP. So in a patient without elevation of their bilirubin specifically, uh, we really try to make sure we've identified the presence of a stone before we entertain an ERCP. Uh, we have this very complicated algorithm, which I'm happy to share with any of you about how we think about and manage some of these bile duct stone patients based on some of our data. But at the end of the day, we use conjugated bilirubin. If it's elevated, you likely need an ERCP. If the bile duct size is more than eight, we watch this patient, repeat an ultrasound the next day, um, and then kind of depending on what else is going on with that patient. At our center, we do a fair number of combined laps, laparoscopic cholecystectomies with same anesthesia ERCP, uh, but at the same time, it depends on uh, obviously our concern for the presence of stone, and we use uh, endoscopic ultrasound in MRCP in the variable or borderline cases. Um, again, as I mentioned, in pancreatitis, we really certainly have changed. Uh, if we have abnormal imaging in labs or improving imaging in labs, it certainly changes how we, uh, we look. So the top upper left, we have imaging with visualized bile duct stone in the setting of pancreatitis. We can do EUS and ERCP. But if it's not and you go to that blue box, likely past stone, those patients can safely proceed to laparoscopic cholecystectomy, uh, or if we're not sure, they can get an MRCP. Um, and again, finally, if the, it's positive for stone, they get the ERCP. If it's negative, they can get their lap coli and an IOC. So again, I think we've really tried to use this. And actually, one of my current fellows is actually studying our pathway, uh, both locally as well as in a, in a larger group. So we look forward to that data soon. Um, when it comes to stenting and pancreatitis, I think Greg Oraz in Poland really has done some nice work. Uh, retrospective evaluation of 200 patients with CP between 1988 and 2012. A uh, total of 223 pancreatic stent procedures in 72 children. The median number of stent replacements was three. There was a statistically significant decrease in the number of pancreatitis episodes per year. Um, pancreatic stenting was, stenting was performed for more frequently in patients with hereditary pancreatitis uh, and anatomic anomalies. Uh, pancreatic duct stenting is safe and effective in children with CP. And this therapy should be recommended, especially for children with hereditary pancreas and pancreatitis and patients with anatomic anomalies. 
Now our group in it within Inspire looked at 117 patients, 40% when at least underwent at least one ERCP. And I would say this number has significantly dropped since this paper was published, but the procedure was more commonly performed in children, CP compared to a, a, acute recurrent. Uh, the utility of therapeutic ERCP was reported to be similar between the two. And at least when asked, patients were asked, it was felt, or the physician it was asked, thought to be helpful for at least one indication in both groups. But the predictors for undergoing therapeutic uh, ERCP and to have a benefit were presence of obstructive factors like a stone in both ARP and CP and Hispanic ethnicity or white race. Therapeutic ERCP is, was of highest benefit if there was ductal obstruction. Uh, as you're aware of, Inspire has gone to look at multiple patients, a multi-center and international study. Um, I'll go, skip through these and you'll have these available for you, uh, but mainly to look at these uh, mutations which were previously unrecognized. And uh, the, our current study is Inspire 2, uh, looking at uh, longitudinal uh, effect of patients with uh, recurrent and chronic pancreatitis. And uh, we now have over almost close to 1,000 patients now uh, and have enrolled patients that were previously in our first study in collecting biospecimens. Um, in the first 500 patients, uh, I'll share with you some of the data. Again, looking at our center, at least at that time, was a uh, lead enroller, but not anymore. Um, multiple centers, again, around the world. And um, study definitions, which you're familiar with for acute pancreatitis. And our findings uh, were that the majority of children are CP uh, reported a prior episode, which is not that surprising. Gender distribution was similar, although there's some data coming out on females. Uh, look for that soon. Uh, ARP was more common in Hispanics, uh, chronic pancreatitis in non-Hispanics. Children with genetic mutations were more likely to present with CP compared with acute recurrent pancreatitis. And uh, one of the things I want to point out is that in acute recurrent pancreatitis, 50% had at least one uh, gene uh, between CFTR, PRSS1, SPINK, and CTRC. Uh, several had obstructive factors and 25% were toxic or metabolic factors. And then we have on the chronic side, 75% compared to about 3% in adults uh, had significant uh, genetic factors, 33% in, in um, chronic or in uh, obstructive and 15% were toxic or metabolic. So I think that's really important. Um, several other findings recently, we didn't I think previously appreciate how important CTRC was, uh, and we're now seeing that as well as we're now seeing uh, acute um, sorry, autoimmune pancreatitis in children, which is more similar to the type two in adults. However, only 25% had elevated IgG4, uh, cross-sectional imaging abnormal in all children. Again, I think that's something that we certainly need a little bit more data on, but it's interesting. Um, in conclusion, uh, we have some updated definitions. We now have a clear role for genetics and acute recurrent pancreatitis and chronic pancreatitis. Early hydration, I think is important, but what and how fast to be determined. Uh, we certainly need more standardization in pediatrics despite lack of evidence. And there's certainly a changing role of imaging and procedures that favors less CT, more MRCP, more endoscopic ultrasound, and uh, we'll certainly have to see where ERCP lives in this. So I wanna thank you. These are my research collaborators and clinical uh, collaborators. And I very much appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. And again, hopefully some, someday in the future, we uh, get to meet in person and hope everyone is safe. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Douglas, for giving an excellent overview of starting with definition and uh, the use of uh, the therapeutic endoscopy in um, uh, the pancreatic tissue.